Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grace Church and welcome to a new series, Hymns from Grace. We're uh, happy to bring this to you because I think one of the one of the, perhaps the greatest sadnesses about not being able to come together has been not having our opportunity to have congregational song. Uh, and truth be told, even if we do come back together uh, in the relatively near future, we probably won't have much congregational song still for a while. Uh, so in because of that, I thought a way to bring some hymns to you would be for us to spend some time together like this virtually. Uh, so on Tuesdays, uh, at least for the fall, we'll, we will come to you uh, with some hymns that you've suggested. So a number of people have emailed me, and you're welcome to do that. My email's probably in this email somewhere This that's coming out to you, certainly on the Grace website, vedwards at gracepvd.org. Send me your favorite hymns from the Hymnal 1982, Wonder, Love, and Praise, Leave Us, any of our hymnals or, or hymns from your childhood. Uh, if I can find it, uh, we'll, we, you know, I'll put it on the list. Happy to do that. Uh, and we can share some time, hear the hymns uh, played. The hymns will be uh, attached, so you're welcome to print them out if that's helpful while we're talking about them. If you want to pause and print them, you can do that. Uh, have, them, have them there in front of you so we can look at text, that sort of thing. Um, this is somewhat historical, a little bit of historic, uh, information for you today, particularly just a little general information about hymns, but mostly each week we'll focus on three hymns or so and hear a little bit about uh, their background, both the tune and the text. All hymns have two parts, a tune and a text, and sometimes they were written together and sometimes they were not, and they were paired later. Uh, so we'll give you some information on that. Uh, some of the information today, I just have to give a, a couple of shout outs. Uh, the English musician Colin Malby uh, has a wonderful uh, website with some great uh, hymn information, some historical information about hymnody, and so I am grateful for uh, using some of that information today. And also, just a, a bit of show and tell, there's a, a four volume set of books uh, called the Hymnal 1982 Companion. So, our hymn book in the church is the Hymnal 1982. And this uh, collection of books gives great information and resource about the hymns uh, throughout four volumes. So this is also really, really helpful. And I have a, a few other uh, interesting resources in my office as well that I, from the shelf, I can pull it. And of course, these days we have the internet. Um, but mo mainly what I wanna have happen on these sessions together is for you to get to hear some hymns, hear something about your hymns, the ones you've, you've chosen. Uh, if you've sent me hymns, don't despair. Again, we're going to do two today, and then most weeks three, we'll get to them. I, I will try to get to everybody's uh, hymn, and if you haven't sent them in, please do. So, yes, hymn is our our congregational song, our community singing. We have a wonderful choir at Grace Church, and the choir has music that just the choir sings, but the hymns belong to all of us and really are the musical meat of any of our services, whether it's Eucharist or Evensong. Uh, it, it's just the time when the whole assembly or community can lift their voice, lift our voices together. So I'm just going to start today with a little bit of history. I have my cue cards here because it's more history than I can memorize. Um, and this is a sweeping fast uh, overview. So if you want more hymn history, Google history of hymns. Uh, otherwise, just uh, see if this gives you a little bit of background. We'll start about the time of the Reformation, roughly the 16th century. The reformers wanted the liturgy in the vernacular or the language of the people. They also wanted hymns that could be sung by people, uh, moving away from Gregorian chant or plain song, which could only be sung by the monks, was most always in Latin and, and really was, was geared to those educated in Latin, which usually were the monks. The reformers wanted the hymns based strictly on scriptures though, which yielded metrical psalmody. Uh, this is taking a psalm uh, from the, well, the Psalter, in our case, the prayer book, and then making it rhyme, changing the words around enough that you can make it into metered rhyme, and then you can set that to music and sing very regularly. Uh, this is an example. It's actually not a, an early, early example. It's a 19th century example, but I'll, I'll tell you. So our Psalm 23 in our prayer book, uh, in the modern language, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You don't have to have a PhD in poetry to know that that is not metered and it also does not rhyme. So an example then would be out of our hymn book, hymn 663, the Lord my God, my shepherd is. So this was done by F. Bland Tucker, which was one of our, our uh, great 20th century actually hymn writers, uh, but it's a metrical paraphrase of the Psalm. The Lord my God, my shepherd is, how could I want or need? In pastures green, by streams serene, he safely doth me lead. 
Now, I'm not, I'm not making fun of Mr. Tucker's uh, uh, arrangement here, uh, but it, it's, it is rhythm, rhythmic, and it is metered, and it rhymes, and then it can go with a, a metrical tune and makes it supposedly easy to sing. Something like this. So very sort of four square, uh, lovely in its own right. So that was one of the things that was going on at the time. But this also created a divide between those who wanted the metrical psalmody, just the psalms set metrically, and hymnody that was going beyond just scripture. This can, uh, created sort of a divide that was quite controversial, particularly in the Anglican Church, which our, our history, Anglican Episcopal Church, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. We're still talking mostly in England at this point. The Reformation also coincided with the dawn of printing, which gave people printed hymns in the vernacular. So that was also happening at the same time. Not only could you get a hymn in words you could understand, it could actually be printed and you could, you could hold it or you could see it as well. Martin Luther, a name probably most, most of us know, a radical theologian and fine musician, uh, sort of seen as the father of the Reformation, though he, he really, really did want to reform. He didn't really want to make a new church. He was really trying to reform the one that was there. He contributed greatly to hymnody during the Reformation. And if you think of probably his greatest and most famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress, the Lutheran hymn, uh, so uh, Martin Luther played a great role in all of this. And then the Reformation and the use of the vernacular also paved the way for Bach and his endless harmonizations of German chorales and German chorale tunes, which are, are hymn tunes. Uh, so even in our own hymnal, there are a number of hymn tunes that Bach harmonized. He didn't necessarily write the melody, but he harmonized them. Uh, here's one, the Passion Chorale, one of the most famous. <laughs> Sore Wounded, which we often sing uh, in Passion Week on Good Friday, sometimes on Palm Sunday as well. So moving on just a bit, Isaac Watts, the next big name we're going to talk about, revolutionized hymnody by giving the English people hymns that reflected their beliefs, but had sometimes only vague scriptural references, as opposed to the metrical psalmody, which was essentially a literal quote of scripture just rearranged. Uh, Isaac Watts, quite famous, uh, two hymns that you probably know, uh, that two of his most famous texts that he wrote, he wrote the, the words to these. So it's his words, but I'll just play them to the tunes that you recognize probably. The great Christmas hymn, Joy to the World. And also another very famous hymn of Isaac Watts that uh, is a, a staple of our hymn repertoire in the church today. Oh God, our help in ages past. If you ha have watched this past Sunday's uh, views, uh, Voices of Grace worship, we had two anthems that the Grace Church Choir and Choristers recorded for you specifically for that for that worship service. Uh, the second anthem was, uh, no, sorry, the first anthem was Vaughn Williams' Oh How Amiable, which is settings of Psalm 84 and Psalm 90, uh, based on that. But at the end, it uses Oh God, Our Help, the, Watt, the great Watts hymn, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. It uses the first stanza of that hymn to close out the anthem. So maybe you just heard that. But it was really the Wesley brothers, Charles and John, who really helped hymns as we know them come of age. They were contemporaries of Watts, and they insisted that hymns, both words and music, should be written to stir the congregation, reinforce its religious emotions, and play on the feel-good factor. I'm not sure they actually said feel-good, but, but that was the idea. So all of this was going on, and this matter about sort of scriptural hymns and vaguely scriptural or non-scriptural hymns uh, sort of came to a head in Sheffield, England in 1819, when vicar Thomas Cotterell imposed Methodist-style hymnody on his congregation. Now, I know some of you are listening to this. Maybe, uh, Lois Lewis, if you're listening, you probably think, ooh, Methodist-style hymns, I like those. Methodist-style hymnody on his congregation. The people rebelled and took him to the diocesan consistory court. The case was heard by the chancellor of the Diocese of York, who, 
in a typical Anglican compromise, concluded that both hymns and metrical psalms were illegal in Anglican liturgy, but because of their widespread use, he didn't feel like he could really enforce his decision. So how's that for a classic, basically nothing being done about anything? Uh, so so he, they went to court about this. They, the the uh, chancellor said, neither one is right, but you're all doing it, so go ahead and do it anyway. This really opened the floodgates to all manner of hymns, including gospel hymns, and coupled with the pioneering work of Watts and the Wesleys, really laid the foundation for our Anglican hymnody as we know it today. The other great impetus was the publication in 1861 of Hymns Ancient and Modern. This is an English publication. Its enlightened committee insisted that the book should reflect the very, should reflect the very best of the many traditions of hymnody. And it was amazing success. Sales reached 500,000 annually, and this was at a time when many people still couldn't read or write. And by 1912, it had sold a staggering 60 million copies, and it is still in print today. Hymns Ancient and Modern. You can get it on Amazon or eBay, probably, if you want to. In our American Episcopal Church, we have we've all of this is sort of winnowed down to our hymnals. Our principal hymnal is the hymnal 1982. It replaced the hymnal 19 or the 1940 hymnal. I, I would love to ask somebody on the committee how they decided to make the 1940 hymnal then become the hymnal 1982, but that's what they did. And we have a couple of uh, supplemental hymnals that have been published uh, since. Wonder, Love, and Praise, uh, which has some more contemporary style hymns, a few gospel-ish hymns, really focuses more on some contemporary style hymns, some hymns of different eth ethnic backgrounds. And then Leave Us Too, which is Lift Every Voice and Sing, primarily a gospel hymnal, has some of those hymns that uh, those of us who grew up in the Protestant tradition in the South and Methodism and Presbyterianism and, and Baptist, uh, some of those hymns appear in Leave Us. And in addition, we have a hymnal called Voices Found, a collection of hymns by women. Mostly here at Grace Church, mostly, we use the hymnal 1982. Uh, and that's where we draw for our, our weekly hymns that we use for our worship. So again, a very quick and, and sort of fast-paced overview to get us up to the hymnal today, because what I want to talk about are the hymns that you want to hear about. So we had some great uh, uh, requests for hymns, and, and I picked two uh, just classic, big, bold Anglican hymns today to start with. Um, and the first one is hymn 57. Uh, this hymn was requested by Brian Ehlers, and Brian is a, a wonderful friend of Grace Church. He's actually a parishioner at St. Stephen's, but he spends a lot of time with us here for our noon re recitals on Thursdays and for even songs, concerts, that sort of thing. So we're happy to honor Brian's hymn, hymn request. He was the first person to respond. Hymn 57 uh, is Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. Uh, that's the text, and the tune name is Helmsley. Um, so all hymns can be known two ways, by their first line of their text. So in this case, it would be Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending or by their tune name, in this case, Helmsley. So when you look at your printed hymn, if you've printed your hymn out or you're looking at it online, let me just get to hymn 57. Excuse me. At the bottom of the hymn itself, and yours would look a little different because this is the accompaniment edition, but still at the bottom, it will tell you who wrote the words and who wrote the music. And right after music in italics will be the tune name. Here it says Helmsley. That means the music itself, with no words, has its own name, and that's called Helmsley. Um, just remember, I said early on, hymns might have a tune and a text written at the same time, sometimes by the same person, sometimes by two people, but it could be that they were written to go together. Many, many hymns have a text written by one person at one point in time, a tune written by another person at another point in time, and then they get paired together, either by a, an editor of a hymnal or, or a, a, a musician. Sometimes the person who wrote the text were looking for a tune. Somebody may have written a tune and wants to find a wonderful text that will fit it, that, that it can go all of those ways. So hymn 57 is a hymn for Advent. Uh, the, the top of our hymnal 1982 pages give us the season of the year or the appropriate uh, subject of the hymn. They don't give the title of the hymn. So hymn 57 is not called Advent. That's the season that it's uh, most suited for. Uh, we often use this uh, on the first Sunday of Advent, and, and traditionally we use it as the closing hymn at our Advent lessons and carol service. Originally, the text was titled Thy Kingdom Come, and it first appeared in Charles Wesley's anonymously published Hymns of Intercession for All Mankind. 
I uh, don't know why he anonymously published it, but he did it that way. This was published in Bristol, England in 1758. So the words are quite, quite old. The text as we know it today in, in our hymnal has been revised over the years. Uh, the current one in our hymnal is the fourth revision since 1871. So it, the, you know, editors and continue to tweak texts and try to make uh, texts fit the times in which we're living. Um, and, and often still we can't keep up because things change so fast as we all know. Several of the stanzas are inspired by the book of Revelation. So it's a powerful text. If you've got it in front of you, be sure to, to read the text. Uh, really wonderful. Uh, this is all about the, you know, the, second, the second coming. And so there are lots of Revelation type imagery there. Uh, John Wesley printed a version of the tune Helmsley. So now we're talking about the music with Charles's text in 1765. The attribution of the tune was to Thomas Oliver's, a preacher who said he adapted the tune from something he heard whistled in the street. Now that's pretty funny to me. Uh, so he's walking down the street and he hears a, hears a, a tune and he thinks it gets stuck in his head, an earworm, and he thinks, I'll make a hymn tune out of that. Uh, it turns out it really was already a piece of music, and he, but he heard it whistled and he, he adapted it and, and turned it into the tune Helmsley. Helmsley was not widely used as an Anglican or Episcopal circle in the Anglican or Episcopal circles until the famous English composer Rafe von Williams picked it out for the English hymnal. He transformed it into the stately Edwardian tune we know today. So one of the interesting things, before I play the hymn, one of the interesting things about uh, tune names, so Helmsley is the name of the music again, remember, the first line of the text is, lo, he comes with clouds descending, but the tune name, Helmsley. Uh, it's really interesting to see where composers choose their tune name, what inspires it. So in this case, Helmsley is a small Yorkshire town whose vicar, Richard Conyers was one of Wesley's friends and allies in the church. The tune was likely given its name by Martin Madden, the first chaplain of the Lock Hospital in London, who published the tune and text together in a collection of 1763. Uh, so Helmsley, a small Yorkshire town. So I'm going to play the hymn for you. Again, you have it in front of you, and I'm going to uh, play an, int an introduction like I might play on a Sunday to lead in, and then I'll play the four stanzas, uh, and I'll try to color the stanzas by the text uh, to use the different sounds on the organ. Uh, this, this text has so many things. Um, when you talk about uh, who Christ being sold and pierced and nailed him to the tree, the verse that talks about, uh, then it goes on with deeply wailing, deeply wailing. The next verse talks about with what rapture. So really wonderful text painting opportunities. As a hymn player, I don't do a lot of things that distract people from singing the hymn. So I don't change the harmonies much. I add some flourishes, I add some passing notes, try to do some things with the registration. But in general, our, our job as organists are to play the hymn so that people can comfortably and reliably sing the hymn along. And so I hope you'll actually sing, sing with us as, as we go along. Um, just one other word I wanted to say is about descants. So the hymn has a melody. All hymns have a melody. Let's hear the melody of this, just the beginning. Very well suited to the text. Lo, he comes with clouds descending. And on the word descending, listen to what happens. Clouds descending. So very nice text painting. A descant is a part that is written to go above the melody, usually sung by the sopranos or the choristers or both. In our case, we usually have both. And it decorates the melody. My dear friend, Dr. Barry Rose says that descants are to be a decoration and not an annihilation, meaning the sopranos need to be kept a bit under wraps so that it doesn't obliterate the tune which the congregation is still singing. I don't know that we always make it that. I don't know that we always accomplish that. Uh, so I've written over a hundred descants to hymns in, in my time. And of course there are thousands upon other thousands of descants that other people have written. Uh, I actually kind of like mine, so I use those often. Uh, but I'll just show you how this would work on the first line of this hymn. So here's the melody again. So that's the melody. And then there's a descant that is separate. Here's the descant. The next word in the hymn, this, the descant would be for the last stanza. Usually it's for the last stanza. Doesn't have to be, but usually, and it is in this case. So the text is, Yea, amen, let all adore thee, high on thine eternal throne. So I did a little text painting myself. The descant sings, Yea, amen, let all adore thee, 
high, and then a very high note from the sopranos on the word high. So I'll put it together. I'll play the melody on a tuba, so you hear the melody louder than the descant, and then I'll play the descant a little bit more like a decoration, not so much an annihilation. And so forth. So what I'm going to do today, because we don't have choir here, is when I get to the fourth stanza, I'm going to sort of play bits of my descant on top of the melody as well. So this is hymn 57, Lo, He Comes With Clouds Descending. Helmsley is the tune name. The words by Charles Wesley. The melody based, they think, based on a tune by uh, Thomas Arne in England. That's the tune being whistled on the street. But it's harmonized and really filled out by Rayfon Williams. It uh, has four stanzas. Please sing along if you've got it printed out. I'll do an introduction and then four stanzas.
like it. One of the greatest hymns ever. Thank you, Brian, for requesting it. The last lines, the Alleluia, 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 Thou shalt reign and Thou alone. And uh, the descant comes together on the final Alleluia with the melody. Then the melody sings Thou on the downbeat in an octave above to stress Thou shalt reign, the sopranos. And I can do it even on the louder trumpet. <laughs> first sopranos on a high B. Quite thrilling uh, and uh, can't wait until we can do that with not just the organ but with everybody all singing together. So yes, thank you Brian for that fabulous, fabulous suggestion. So we'll do one more hymn today. As I mentioned, we'll try to do three most weeks but I won't have all that history lesson at the beginning. This one was requested by two of my very favorite people in the world. Adrian Southgate, who is our senior warden here at Grace Church and an alto, wonderful alto in the Grace Choir and Mother LaVon Seifert, who has a long association with Grace Church uh, as a, a part-time associate priest here. She's filled in for Father Jonathan when he was on sabbatical, uh, and she's also just a dear friend. And they both separately requested hymn 541. So this is Come Labor On. Another favorite of mine. This is a grand old hymn of the Anglican Church. Number 541, the section in the hymnal is the church's mission. The first line, come labor on, and the tune name, ora labora. We'll talk about that in a moment. So this text and tune have been described by a musician and scholar Paul Westermeyer as heady with optimism. Boy, can we use that today, something that's heady with optimism. The text was written by Jane Laurie Borthwick, English, uh, and was first published in her Thoughts for Thoughtful Hours. I'd like to find that and see what else she's got in there. Thoughts for Thoughtful Hours. This was published in London in 1859. The tune, Ora Labora, was composed by T. Tertius Noble. Perhaps Thomas' first name, I think. Thomas Tertius Noble. One of the great names uh, of musicians in the church. Uh, and it was composed uh, when the Borthwick text, Come Labor On, entered the hymnal in 1916. Dr. Noble was at St. Thomas, uh, Fifth Avenue. He was at York Minster, first in England. Uh, sorry, and St. Thomas Fifth Avenue lured him away to found the renowned Boys Choir School there, the St. Thomas Choir School. They brought Dr. Noble over from England to, to set that up and put it in motion and show them how that would work. And he is the composer of the tune. Latin, uh, ora labora, it's, uh, ora is prayer and labora is, is labor or work. So this is, this is uh, prayers and works. Uh, the idea that that's how we that's how we serve in the church is through our prayers and through our works. Uh, this is again a grand and expansive tune, uh, and works really well in a great big building like Grace Church with a big rumbly organ. Uh, there's also a descant uh, on this hymn that I have, have. Lots of people have written wonderful descants to this. Uh, Jerry Hancock at St. Thomas Fifth Avenue uh, has written a wonderful descant, uh, but uh, today we'll we'll use mine just again to show you. A little bit about how that works, the tune. That's the tune. When the desk can't joins it. Servants well done. So the melody sings out. Servants well done. And in the desk camp, we give them a breath. Servants well done. So wonderful, uh, just a wonderful melody and, and beautiful, beautiful uh, words calling us to work and serve in the church. Uh, both in the building and outside. So we'll, I'll leave you today with him 541, Come Labor On, and thanks again to Adrian Southgate and LaVon Seifert for uh, suggesting 541. We'll look forward to seeing you next week uh, on the, let's see, 5 and 7 is 12, 22nd, 
and we will have three more hymns. Uh, we'll do some in different styles next week. Uh, but for today, we'll end with Come Labor On. I'll do a little bit of an introduction. Um, and then what I might do, uh, just to show how we treat hymns sometimes, if it's a processional hymn, sometimes we need to, to add a little bit of time to get the choir where they need to be, especially if it's coming in or if it's going out and getting ready for a desk camp. I don't like them to sing the desk camp walking. So uh, David or I, if it's a closing hymn and the choir's not in place, we play a little bit after the fourth stanza to get them in place and then we lead into the fifth. So I'll, I'll maybe do just a little of that today too. All right, here we go. Thank you. 